and let's begin. Hello, my name is Michael Bowman. I'm a senior malware researcher at something called the Malware Research Institute. It's my fourth year here at 44Con, and it's a bit about to talk about why I'm here. Well, it's my fourth time here. I was talking about malware as a hobby. I talked about how to control the your, your PC using Arduino. Um, the last year, I talked about looking at the malware analyzing as a, a big data problem using Hadoop and stuff. And this year, I will talk about malware reverse engineering. Um, as I said, I'm a I call myself a malware researcher. I'm a founder of the Malware Research Institute. And it's, it's quite fun, actually. I discovered that anyone can call themselves an institute. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound very good, right? Malware Research Institute. Well, it's actually <coughs> quite funny. Oh, oh, by the way, I have a big family. I have six kids, one more to go. So uh, next year I have seven, and hopefully that will be the end of it. But I mean, the Nissan we're having is only a nine seater, eight passengers. So it's time to get a new driving license. So when I was started here talking about the malware research as a hobby, this is was my Malware Research Laboratory. It was housed under the stairs in my house. It was a motherboard, the bare essentials to make a computer, bolted to an IKEA TrueFast furniture. There's not even a case for it. So that's where I started out. And it sort of worked until last summer when my hard drive decided to commit suicide, and I had to start over, and it was very, very heartbreaking for me, because when I was talking at the 44Con last year, I just got the realization that I lost over six terabytes of malware samples. So, do I start over, or do I just call it quits? Well, I'm here now, so I started over. And I said, okay, let's buy some new hardware. So I got myself some new servers that's rack mounted all second hand. And I got myself a, a server rack, which actually is brand new. So I now, instead of having a, a true fast IKEA furniture on my stairs, I now have an 18 rack units rack on the mouse stairs. Oh, and I was using a lot of Amazon services. A lot, a lot. Not even, I'm paying about 20 quid a month. So, not that much. So, to the topic. I'm going to talk about malware anti-reversing. And as a malware researcher, you get a lot of problems trying to figure out how they, what the, what the malware is doing. They don't want you to let you know. So I come across a couple of t uh, techniques. I've been reading a, a bunch of others. So this is just a, a recap of all the techniques I know about so far. Uh, this is towards a Windows x86 environment, so no Linux, no Macintosh, nothing like that. Just plain Windows, but that's what the malware likes. So it's either it's uh, uh, anti-reverse engineering or just silly stuff to take your time because, I mean, I have a very, very limited time. I mean, six kids have a day job, so yeah. Let's go to the technique number one, breakpoints. 
I'm going to go through the, let's just, just keep ahead there. So the int three breakpoint, it's the normal debugger breakpoint. If you're doing a breakpoint in a program that's using your all the, all the debug or wind debug or so on, this is what you're doing. And how it does it is that it replaces the instruction you want to break on with an int three. And once the debugger sees it, it's replacing it with the instruction you actually wanted to see and break on. So what, what the malware is, is doing, it's scanning itself for the opcode for int three. See if the memory I'm using is actually having a debug instruction. And if it finds it, it says, okay, I'm de being debugged, let's behave nicely. Oh, uh, after this, I will recap how to, how to countermeasure it, if possible. Uh, another way is to do a memory breakpoint, which means that the memory author is uh, marking some memory as a is page guard, which means that you get an exception once you hit it. Once you're trying to access the, the, the allocated memory, you're getting a page guard exception. So then you, the malware can have some code that says, oh, I got an exception, this is not expected, I'm being debugged. You also have hardware breakpoints. Uh, it's using, it, very similar to memory breakpoints. It's just in different registers, works slightly different. Uh, it's unfortunately too complicated for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not that professional yet. So how to countermeasure this is one. Well, if the malware code is looking for in three ops in its memory for see if it's being debugged, you just need to look if it's looking, okay? For memory breakpoints, well, look for allocations that has the page guard option set. No biggie. For hardware, you can use the get thread context or get thread con set get uh, thread context to look to discover if it's in a hardware breakpoints enabled. You can also use the SEH uh, exception handling to discover them. Next technique though is timing techniques. It's very, many malware is, is having a sleep period where it's like you go and execute and then it waits a while before it's actually doing some bad stuff. And the whole idea is that during um, the analysis phases, your, your timer will run out before the malware is doing the bad stuff. Google has a, a famous 15 minute time frame. So if you don't do anything stupid or malicious in 15 minutes, it was okay, Google approved it. You just need to wait 16 minutes. So as a researcher, I want to cut this one down. So I'm, I'm changing my sleep call to just returns right away. The thing is that you can use something like RDTSC to, to count how many clock cycles has elapsed. You're doing a, a, really a number of clock cycles. You um, do your extraction, you read the next value, and you calculate and see if the amount of time that passed is what you're expecting. So if you're saying you want to wait five minutes, you, well, you want to see five minutes of clock time passing by. You can also use uh, the get uh, tick count, uh, get time of, uh, get using get time, and numbers of timing functions to find out.
So to, to, to contract this one. Well, for the Win32 timing functions, you can always do a DLL injection and, and just lie. You know, you, in, in, you do an, a DLL injection to, over, to hook the sleep call, so it always returns zero. So it's, all this video sleep zero returns all uh, directly, but you need to, to live to the whole system. But yeah, it was actually five minutes in the past, or, or one day, or whatever. So don't forget how that you need to lie to every single function. Um, for the RD, RDTSC, you can actually uh, mark it as a, a privilege instruction. So, so you load the driver that marks the, the RDTSC as a privilege instruction, and then you can do your manipulation. But you have to remember to keep the timings correctly. You can't have the day of the time of day say a different thing than how many seconds was it since boot up. So next part is the Windows internals. Am I going too fast? No? Okay, cool. So when you do, uh, you, you put a piece of code on the debugging, it, it's, it marks in the system that the code is actually being debugged. And what you need, what you want to do as a, a malware author is to detect that you're being debugged or as a, a malware researcher as myself, stop it from being detected that I'm actually looking at the code. So the process debug flags, you can actually use an undocumented uh, a class when you, when, when you run it to the anti-query process information. Which means that when you are doing the anti-query process, probably the process debug flags, like this, it re returns the reverse of, of the you new know, uh, debug inherit. So it's more complicated than calling is the bug present. So of course, if it's false, then the debugger is there and you do no evil stuff. There is a, another one similar to that one that you are having a, um, another debug update the anti query imp information process. And that one is a bit harder to, to manipulate. So that one is ori originating from the kernel itself. You also have a, a, a proper API that hides the a thread from being debugged, which means you don't get any events from that thread to the debugger, including breakpoints. So an easy way is to you create a thread using the thread hiding technique, and the debugger doesn't see it. What you need to do is intercept all the thread creation and make sure that that option is no longer present. This is one of those uh, techniques, the, the block input techniques. It's, it's not really anti-reversing. It's just making you pissed. Because what it does is it's blocking all the inputs from mouse, from keyboard, and only the thread that called it can actually remove it. 
So basically, your computer stops working. Another easy way is to use the output debug string. It's uh, how you can get your program print f to the debugger. And what you can do, what you, you do as a malware author or, or someone who doesn't want to get reversed is you call it and then you check if there are any error messages. No error messages, debugger is present. Simple enough. So how do we go about recovering from this one? I don't know, can you see this? <laughs> because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, the slides will be available both from 44.com and from my own site. So anti query information, you look for the, um, you hook it, you lie about it. You, 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 you filter out that option. Um, when you do in debug uh, object handle, you just go and remove all the debug handles. Again, you do any, you, you do any DLN injection and just make sure that you're uh, acting as a, as a root kit to the malware. Again, uh, same thing for the thread hiding. Scrub it away. Don't let that option be set. Um, block input, same thing. Make it a no op. Or just step over. And uh, hook the up debug, output debug string to always return an error. So it's not really that hard for the Windows internals. No new drivers, it's just standard deal injection. Process exploitation. That, that is a series of quite interesting techniques. If you start with the open process, it's when you are having a program on the debugger, it inherits the SC debug privilege. So, what the malware is doing is, is trying to open something like uh, csrss.exe, which is a privileged process. You're not, it's not supposed to be able to, to attach to it. And if you get no errors, well, something's wrong, right? You're being debugged. This is uh, quite the uh, debugger. Um, called dependent, depending on uh, if the debugger is uh, doing the proper thing and, and reduces privileges, you, you're still having an uh, issue opening other processes. But as a sta stand, standard, you're having privilege to attach to any process in the system. You can always check the parent process and see if that is the parent you're expecting. So like if you are delivering a exe you're expecting someone to click on, well, check if the parent process is in Windows Explorer. If you are a malware ex expecting to be executed from Internet Explorer, well, check if your parent is in Internet Explorer. So that's not really rocket science either. This one is quite cool actually, self-debugging. What you do is you, you spawn a child and the child is attaching a debugger to the parent. So when you're trying to attach a debugger to the parent, you can't because it's already being debugged.
You can also use unhandled exception filter. Well, when you're causing an exception, you have a, this, your, your exception handler, you have the SEA chain, and, some, and you have the unhandled exception. When you're calling on the debugger, you're actually not getting an unhandled exception. So you detect that, well, my unhandled exception suddenly get handled. Um, it has a drawback. It kills the process instead of continue re uh, executing it. But if you're doing an anti-reversing technique, I think it's quite okay in a way. Don't you agree? If you want, if you want. Yeah. I mean, if you're a malware, yeah. If if you're up to bad stuff, I mean, this can you do for exploit the uh, creation or whatever. This is not just malware. Where anti query object, you have a object all types information class you can pass to it, which basically gives you a list of all the objects, and you can traverse it and traverse it until you find debug objects. It's a variant of the one I talked about earlier. But instead of looking directly, you traverse the list yourself because you don't trust in the system. So how do we protect against this one? Well, open process. Make sure that the debugger drops the uh, SE debug privilege. So you can't attach the, the analyzing the analyzed so software can't actually attach to previous in, um, processes. And if you uh, for the parent, well, again, just fake it. Return the value you are exp you want it to have. So even if you are in other debug, make sure it the, the, uh, gets what you're expecting like Windows Explorer. For the parent, the, 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 the parent is spawning a child that attached a debugger. You can actually set the, the, the debug port in uh, e-process information to zero. And then you can attach another debugger. For unhandled exception filter, it's just making sure that the debugger is doing the right thing. It's, it's not a quick fix on that one. For anti-query object, well, deal injection, fake the information. I mean, if the bad guys can do a deal injection, injection, why can't we? So anti-dumping. Dumping is when you let the malware load into RAM and you then dump the contents of the RAM and suddenly you have an unencrypted, unpacked piece of malware. Easier to, to deal with. There are a few <clears throat> funny or interesting or just waste of time techniques to deal with that. You have something like nanomites, where you're um, changing all the jump instructions in your code to the int3, which is calling the debugger. And um, you store all the original int3s, all the original jump instructions in an encrypted table. And then you're doing the spawning child, debugging the parent technique, and when you hit an in three, uh, um, all up, you're actually looking where you were, using that as input for actually finding the correct instruction you remove from the code, put it back in, and let it go. I mean, it's not impossible to undo that technique, it's just time consuming until you find the key for this algorithm. And then you can just do it backwards and put it all back together. And if, if you really, if, if they really want to mess with you, they're putting a, a couple of um, in threes all over the code. 
but it just doesn't do anything. So, is this breakpoint real or not? The stolen bytes is a variant of non-bytes, but instead of having a, a, an encrypted table on its own, it's actually using bits and pieces of code you already have in the in in the binary or in the in the memory. So you actually don't have a separate piece of code. This is my lookup table. No, no, no. The binary itself is a is a lookup table. So it's very very similar to return oriented programming. If you understand what I mean. Then you can modify the PE header and change the size of image. If your tool is, is actually parsing this PE header and uh, think that, take that as the gospel, well, it's going to be painful. It has some drawbacks, um, some, some tools or, or systems actually require it to be proper. But some badly uh, developed tools actually don't get the whole binary or crashes when using this technique. Then you have the whole virtual machine technique. And when I'm talking talk about virtual machine, I'm, I'm meaning like JVM, not like virtual box not the whole hypervisor, I mean, you're having a byte code that is executing. And you have a lot of dead code, a lot of um, red herrings. It's just doing a, a lot of extra work for what you actually want to do. All in the name for making it, taking it, making it take longer to analyze. Because there is always a time limit on how much time you can afford to spend on a single sample. I mean, sure, if you're uh, Stuxnet or, or Flame, you can spend a lot of time. But we are talking about somewhere between 50,000 and 200,000 variants daily. How many? Is, how how much time do you think you get to analyze one single sample? And um, this tool, Thermida, is actually creating a unique virtual machine environment for every single sample. Think about self-modifying code. You get the idea. Yeah, uh, God pages can also be used for just-in-time loading. So instead of detecting, oh, the bugger is present, I'm going to be nice. You can actually use it. So, oh, you want to access this memory? Well, hold on. Let me load it for you first. Okay, it's loaded. Now you can continue. Oh, you want this piece of memory? Hold on, let me unpack, encrypt it, load it for you, and you can continue. So if you wait until it's, the malware is loaded and you want to grab the, uh, the contents from RAM, you want to get them part of the malware. Because parts of it is not even loaded yet. Or it can be loaded, but in encrypted form somewhere else in the memory. And you can always dump the, the allocations you no longer use uh, as a, some performance penalty that, oh, you, you're on this part of the code. Okay, I don't need this one. I'm doing like a garbage collection. Remove that one. Oh, you need to access again. Okay, I load it again. So 
So that's troublesome if you want to uh, get uh, grab a complete image from the memory. Another cool uh, thing I've seen is the removing the P header from RAM. So you you you're losing all the relocations, imports, exports, all the nice information you want to have. You're just getting a piece of code, but you you're seeing addresses. Jump here, go there, call this. What is that? Don't know. The operation system knows, but it, not by name, just by address. So that's also a, a, a way to bypass anti -ma uh, malware software, antiviruses, because they, okay, I'm looking for malware, I'm looking for malware, malware is executable, okay. Going through, scanning through memory through executables. Well, this is just a bunch of data, Let, let's continue. So, recap, nanomites. Pain in the ass until you, 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 you figure out what the key is. Because until you do, and you want to actually reverse it in using the debugger, it's going to be painful. Stolen code, stolen bytes, same thing there. It's going to be painful until you find out the algorithm they have used to stash away the original code. Size of an image, that's a fairly easy one to bypass. You just need a tool that doesn't follow the RFC and just do. So you don't care about how, how large it says the binary is in memory. I don't care, I'm going to grab it all. Virtual machines, well, that's, that's tough. I am not done running virtual machines myself. I'm just letting them run in a dynamic analysis tool, which means let it run and see what it's actually doing. God pages, well, tough. You need to get it piece by piece. Time consuming, not impossible, time consuming. And removing the PE header, it can be restored. Uh, volatility is quite okay on that uh, on that part, but can be problematic. Next technique: the uh, exploiting the instructions. It's getting very uh, debugger specific now. I have a couple of minutes left. The int 2D is, is another interrupt instruction. Uh, and if you're having an old debug connected to it, you're having a exception. If no debugger is present and you do just your normal exception handling, and continue. If the debugger present, you present, you don't get an exception, and well, you don't do bad stuff. Stack segment. Now, when you stepping through using a debugger, you, it's actually possible to fool it what it's going to be executing next. So. You do a push and a pop SS. And when you're stepping through, if you're stepping through, you're actually getting straight away to the XOR. But if you're actually running the code, it doesn't move as well. Depending on the debugger.
they also a way to exploit the way the debug is using uh, prefixes. So again, you, you're using um, exception handling or no handling of an exception as a, a way to find out if you're being debugged. I've personally not seen this one myself. I just read about it. And recap. Interrupt 2D. Uh, well, don't use all the debug. <laughs> or, or, or look after that instruction and, and see. Normal, normal code doesn't have debug interrupts enabled. For stack simulation, same thing. Make sure you're using an up-to-date patch, non-vulnerable debugger. If you find one, let me know. <laughs> uh, same thing with instruction prefixes. So, um, so I'm doing a lot of dynamic analysis, which means I'm taking a piece of malware, I'm loading it up in my virtual box, and let it run and see what it's doing. And of course, the malware knows about this, so it tries to figure out if it's running in, in a hypervised environment. And that's this while you're looking at the hardware, at the drivers, the operating system, uh, and the serial number of the operating system. What add-ons do you have? Uh, and also doing VMI calls, the virtual machines infrastructure calls. Trying to talk directly to the hardware and see if, if it responds in, a, in a expected ways. It also checks if there is a, an interactive environment. You know, if you are running 10,000 samples a, a week, you don't go around and touch every single sample yourself. So there's no keyboard input, no mouse input. I will trigger on that one. It's like, oh, no one has been using this computer since it's booted up, and yet I'm running. So, for hardware, Make your virtual box or QEMU, whatever you're using, look as much as possible as real hardware. I'm cloning every single piece of computer I get my hands on when it comes to hardware specifications and BIOS and name of the graphics card and vendor and everything. When it comes to drivers, do not use the vendor supplied drivers. Use the Windows one. No need, why hide that the hardware is virtual box or VMware if you're going to load the tools, the drivers for it? Right? For uh, operation uh, OS version or serial, it's mostly for the public well-known uh, sandboxes because those, that information is leaked, so they don't know exactly that, oh, you're in a Geo sandbox or you're in a CW sandbox, or what it's called nowadays, GFI, whatever, or, or a known sandbox. Uh, again, no drag and drop into the, uh, in, into the instrumented environment. Do not touch the virtual machine tools. Not to guess the add-ons. Uh, for VMI calls, uh, make sure you're using a hypervisor you actually can patch. So that's open source, so no VMware. Um, or you can use real hardware. That's the best way to avoid uh, VM detection. 
do not use a VM. Uh, when it comes to interactability, so make sure that the computer is faking as being used. No mode and mouse, make sure that when, it, when the malware is, is asking how long time was it before since the mouse was clicked, it doesn't say five years ago. And when you're faking this interactive, uh, clicking buttons and so on, make sure you're not clicking buttons that doesn't actually exist or is not viewable. Because if you have an OK button that's one by one pixels, and and the user actually managed to click on it, something is off. Uh, they also. Uh, bunch of debugger specific techniques uh, you can look using the find window uh, call and see if you're having a other debug window or wind debug window or any other popular debugger open and see oh you're actually running other debug i'm not going to do anything in it right now uh, you have the output debug string exploit for all the debug. Um, if you're running dynamic analysis side of using Cuckoo, you can actually, sh this, the malware is actually checking if, if it's being DLA injected. And then behave differently. So, how to fix that one? Well, change the name of the of the windows or patch the the call find window call so it doesn't return those names <coughs> for the cuckoo sandbox run on hooked you don't get as much information that part is being worked on but uh, you lose some visibility to actually have it run more. Other techniques, um, you see I have like three minutes left. Other techniques is uh, junk code. Just put a bunch of code it's not going to use or doing nothing, like count the, no the value of pi. Uh, uh, and the anti-reverser is spending a lot of time looking at number of numbers of pi. Also, you have native uh, code permission. As you can, ex you can do the same kind of code in many different ways, using different instructions, different flows. So the code can look a, a lot different, even if it's doing the same thing. Um, no, there's no qu big quick fixes for that one. I'm running out of time, but I'm going to take some time here because I'm last one for today. I have an announcement to make. Can you guess what it will be about? Zombie attack. <laughs> Zombie attack, someone said. Man in the middle. Man in the middle. It's nothing that. Yeah. You're getting married. What? You're getting married. Oh, no, I'm already married. <laughs> now, uh, I'm opening my malware archive, my malware zoo, to the public. I'm using a piece of software called VHK uh, Cage that is available at vhk.malwareresearch.institute. It has a nice REST API where you can upload samples, download samples, search for samples. It's backed up uh, by Amazon, so I'm using Amazon S3 and uh, Amazon EC2 to run this one which means the state of the hardware under the stairs in my house is not insequential. 
However, I don't want to have my site listed as a malware distribution point. So I'm actually going to require you to use credentials to log in. And how to get credentials? Very simple. You email me and ask for them. So you email me at michael at michaelbowman.org. You say, this, I want to access your VHK uh, repository. I'm, I'm John Doe. I'm having and doing malware and this is a hobby or I'm doing it professionally or I'm just interested in see what you're having. Uh, and you give you some contact information. You know, so most of it's kind of cyber stalk you. I mean, I keep in touch like, oh, by the way, I'm planning to have a, a down, plan the downtime. I can mail it up to you. I can say, oh, we just got of a billionth um, Sample or we, um, the now the sample size is now ten terabytes. No, oh, ten petabytes, right? Ter per peta? Yep. Whatever. Just so I can stalk and spam you. But that's me, not not uh, anyone else. If you want to have raw access to the archive, I mean direct access to the SQL database, direct S uh, access to the S3 object store. Just email me at the address and say, hey, I would like to have raw access, direct access, and we can work something out. But if you say, oh, I want to download this 10,000 samples a week, okay. It's going to cost me more to charge you and actually get from the micropayments. But if you say, I want to access everything, we need to talk. As I said, um, just a quick intro. You have a malware add to upload malware. You have malware get and a SHA-256 checksum to download the malware. You have malware find to search for uh, malware. And you can search by hashes and as uh, the usual suspect. SHA-1, SHA-256, MD5, and SSD. I think you can search on CRC32 as well. I'm not sure. You can also search by date, like, oh, who, what samples was uploaded yesterday. You can also tag uh, samples. So you can say, oh, this is a known malware family. I can tag it as such. All uploaded malware be ta is being tagged by your username. So you can see who uploaded who, what. What? Are you tagging it as well, so you're putting families together and stuff? Yeah, I, I, I can do that. I'm not doing it at the moment. But I can add as many tags uh, as, as I want. There's no limit. The docs and the source code is at my GitHub page. So you, you look there, you can, you can duplicate it if you want. I don't know why, but... If you, could, if you think you can do it cheaper than I, I can, uh, please go ahead. I mean, you have to start paying people to access it. Well, thank you. Um, so you can cyberstalk me at mbowman. My email address is michael at michaelbowman.org. And soon it's michael.bowman at malwareresearch.institute. Uh, the malware repository is at vhkh.malwareresearch.institute. At, at the moment, it's just HTTP. HTTPS is done in about a week, so I just need to get my mail sorted, apply for a certificate, and so on, but it's coming. And I also have a blog. It's, it's very out of date at the moment because I'm being busy doing this. I mean, I can write about it, I can do it, I can't do both. So, thank you. Thank you.